Good evening. Welcome. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Uh, can we have a roll call, please, Clerk? Alderman Ashour. Here. Alderman Berry. Here. Alderman Bevere. Here. Alderman Davalos. Here. Alderman Goodman. Here. Alderman Hoffman. Here. Alderman Widener. Here. Alderman Wilson. Here. Thank you. Will those who are able stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? All right, this is the time that we set aside during the meeting for our citizens' comments. If you'd like to comment on a particular item as it comes up in the course of the agenda, you can do that. Um, but we do have uh, some people who have submitted for citizens' comments, and if you'd like to comment and didn't know you had to sign up, you still have time to get your um, flyer into the clerk. But the first person we're going to have tonight is Emily Larson, who is an experienced commenter, and uh, take it away. asked me last week to make some comments when we were talking about Warren Dillon Bloom and it caught me off guard and I'm not a great extemporaneous speaker so I went home and gathered my thoughts and I'd like to tell them to you tonight. Uh, so during the discussion last night or last Monday um, and I've got my thoughts together. This was not a last minute decision by Warrenville Bloom or staff to change out the baskets and to change, I'm sorry, not to change the baskets, to change our vendor for putting them up and taking them down. We contacted staff in early March after hearing from Bullwigs that they would like to stop putting the baskets up for us. The new baskets are heavier and Bullwigs were complaining about the baskets last year and they were looking to retire in the near future so we felt we needed to find a new vendor. So we contacted staff and posed the question, would the city consider putting up the baskets for us? We were encouraged to submit a proposal, which we submitted, dated March the 19th. After conversations in the staff research, the proposal was finally put on the community development agenda for May the 14th, at which time there were no questions raised, and then it was on the council meeting agenda for May the 21st. We never ever thought we would ask for more money above and beyond the grant application. If the city agreed to put up the baskets, we anticipated the cost would come from the line item of funds allocated to Bullwigs. We have paid Bullwigs approx approximately $4,000 every year for the past 10 years just to put up and take down the baskets. We were confident that Public Works could do it faster and for less cost. We did get bigger baskets this year. After testing out six of them last year at the end of Stafford Place, to determine the amount of time it took to water each basket and the amount of water to put in each basket. The new hanging baskets have reservoirs that hold water and wicks that take the water up into the sole bet soil between waterings. Once we discovered these baskets, we knew they would be a big help. But we still need to water about every other day, especially when it's 95 in the shade, and hope to stretch that to every third day once it cools off. Steve Burning of Galusha Farms does our watering. For two seasons, we had to take our baskets down early, probably the end of August, the one year, because less watering compromised the baskets and we were running out of money. They just didn't make it into fall those years. So last year, we were determined to keep the baskets looking nice into September. But it was hot, and that meant lots of daily watering. We had to take $5,000 out of our own fundraising account to pay him after the TAC money was depleted, and he even donated several more waterings out of his own pocket. Warrenville and Bloom cannot physically raise $5,000 every year to supplement the watering and lengthen the growing season. Yes, the baskets are larger, and they will help. We've received our grant funding this year with its watering allocation, in consulting with Steve to remain within the grant amount, we knew we still had to do less, even with the new baskets. The Williams Road Bridge planters have no reservoirs and would still require daily watering in this hot weather. We also felt we had to cut back our hanging baskets by 10, from 54 
to 44 baskets this year. Our goal is to hang up 60 baskets at some point in time. These hanging baskets and all of the city flowers are for the benefit of the community. Warrenville and Bloom volunteers do all the legwork of ordering flowers, planting ground flower planters, maintaining these planters and the native gardens, and diligently weeding all summer long. The hotel motel grants provide a service to the city for our events, and that should include the beautification of the city. I would like to remind the council that the money we get from the hotel motel grant is not taxpayer money. It's a wonderful opportunity for Warrenville and Bloom and other groups to do things to better the community and to make it more attractive. And the offer, and offer events that the mayor is always saying this is the best place for a staycation. One final note, the baskets and Warrenville Road pole planters went up Thursday. Great thanks to Jamie, Rob, and Jeff. We have the best public works workers ever. They were done in under three hours and they got a rhythm going and they had, they had no problems. They're young and strong and Warrenville and Bloom is very grateful for being able to use this service this year and we hope the council will approve our request for next year. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, our next citizen comment is from Dorothy Deer. Uh, Dorothy Deer, 30W077 Penny Lane. And I'm also representing Warrenville and Bloom. Um, first on behalf of all of uh, the WIB people, I do want to thank the city immensely for taking on the task of putting up and, and uh, taking down our baskets. This is a wonderful benefit to us and, and it certainly uh, makes the city, uh, makes us feel that the city's a little more involved when they're part of us and working with us. Um, I did watch them uh, do, put up some of the baskets and I took pictures, so if any of you would like to see them in action, you can look at our Warrenville and Bloom Facebook page. I appreciate Emily's thoughtful response to the discussion that took place last week. And I understand there was a lot of discussion about taking the ba uh, bridge planters down on uh, uh, Will Williams Road. And so, um, and it was mentioned several times, we did not want to drop those uh, planters. We really hated to because we all like them as well, but we really had no choice. And so in order to help you understand more clearly uh, how the budgeting went and how uh, we came to the conclusion to drop them, I'm gonna send you all an email um, explaining that and that, that will help you. I would take too long to do it here. I also want to uh, uh, make, make a comment about the uh, city council agenda tonight with the uh, increase of the hotel motel tax fund, 250,000. I hope you'll all support that because if we can get to that, then we know that the, our grant should be able to fulfill our watering needs in, in the grant instead of uh, ha us having to watch it each year from time to time and try and stay within that budget. Um, I wanna also report on our volunteer planting day on Saturday. We had a great time. We had 24 people come out and the mayor was with us and he brought Mary too, so that was kind of special. It was really a good time. We did a lot of planting and uh, we've added the gazebo area to our planting and we've got two people who have volunteered to take care of that. So the city's gonna look really nice this year. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. And the next person who signed up is Colin Wilkie. Good evening, City Council. Colin Wilkie, 28 West 321 Main Street. Uh, each year I come to the City Council meeting to put into words what I truly feel in my heart. Being the director of the Warrenville Friends of the Fourth Committee has been an absolute pleasure. I owe all this to the people who volunteer their time for the committee, as well as the city itself, including all the aldermen, the mayor, public works, EMA, police, fire, and all the city staff who tirelessly help out the ever-growing operation to make this run smoothly each year. I especially want to give a round of applause to Alma for her unceasing work to make this celebration a joy for myself and the other board members of the Warrenville Friends of the Fourth Committee. Without us coming together as a community, because we all love Warrenville, this event simply would not happen. 
I have been told over and over how much better our community event is compared to other communities that surround us. This year, I believe it is even more so because of your generous additional contribution to our funding. With the children's entertainment on the main stage during the 4th of July, further diversity in our parade program, as well as having our hometown Booze Brothers appearing on the main stage before another amazing fireworks display, we will once again shock and awe anyone who has not previously attended the best Independence Day celebration in DuPage County, perhaps the world. Thank you all for your considerations both in the past, today, and in the future. I hope you all like the small token I have left with Emily to hand out later, which is our new 4th of July logo. I would also like to thank Alma for getting that design for us. So pray to the weather gods for good weather, and please be sure to attend the celebration if you can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, We'll move on to officials and staff comments, and we'll start with Chief Toronto for a fireworks enforcement update. Thank you, Chairman. <clears throat> As was indicated last year after the 4th of July, we had several residents complain about the inordinate amount of illegal fireworks that were being used throughout the community. Uh, based on that, we have a comprehensive enforcement plan that we're going to be putting into action. Uh, we are gonna have officers out both before, during, and after the holiday. Uh, this has been a significant additional expense that has been incurred by the city to pay overtime and holiday rates for the enforcement. Additionally, we have passed a uh, probably a little bit more restrictive ordinance within the city that was approved by the council. The fines are a minimum of $250 to $750 at the administrative adjudication process. Uh, the fireworks that you see sold in the neighboring states are illegal in the state of Illinois. And basically a firework is anything that gives an audible or visual uh, display. So that would be firecrackers, Roman candles, uh, bottle rockets, what have you. They're illegal here. If you have them and you're in possession of them or you're displaying them, uh, you will be at minimum charged on a city ordinance, which would be a minimum of a $250 fine. It could incur anywhere up to a criminal arrest depending on the amount of fireworks that you have uh, and also the uh, strength or the power of these fireworks. Something additionally to keep in mind that we can't safely store these as these are considered explosive devices. So if you're one of those people that invests a significant amount of money in one of these neighboring states and, and bring this cache of illegal fireworks back to your home, and you are charged, you may incur fees that would be assessed by the DuPage County Sheriff's Bomb Squad uh, who would have to come out with their vehicle and personnel to safely dispose of these. So we ask that you please be a good neighbor. These fireworks present a, a significant amount of stress for people that suffer from PTSD as well as infants and children. Small pets are affected by these. Additionally, they represent a clear fire risk and also a risk of personal injury to yourself or others. So we want it to be known. You'll see messages posted regularly on Facebook as well as our mobile sign boards that'll be up throughout the city. And I'll be making uh, announcements at every meeting that fireworks are illegal in Warrenville. If you have them or you're using them and you are caught, it will be significantly um, inconvenient for you either uh, uh, by means of incurring a criminal arrest record or the, uh, the fine. So please uh, enjoy the fireworks displays that the city puts on uh, down at Cerny Park and be a good neighbor. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chief. That, that's very informative and I hope people are listening and hear what you say. Uh, next, we're gonna have an informational presentation from Tim Meyer, the CEO, COO of Fermilab, who's gonna talk to us a little bit about one of our closest neighbors. Good evening. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks, uh, Chairperson, Council, and the community. Uh, my name is Tim Meyer. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Fermilab, and I wanted to spend uh, a few minutes sharing with you uh, the state of the laboratory and what we're up to as uh, one of your closest neighbors. Um, as others have announced their address, I live at Six Sox Circle, so I live actually in the Warrenville side of Batavia, uh, uh, or the Warrenville side of Fermilab. 
So uh, I do appreciate the, the community here. So what I wanted to say about Fermilab, and for some of you this is, uh, you've been here longer than I have. Uh, I've been with Fermilab for about uh, almost four years, but uh, Fermilab is one of a network of 17 uh, federal Department of Energy National Laboratories. The laboratory was founded in 1967, so we've just finished celebrating our, our 50th anniversary. I'll say more about that in a moment. And one of the important aspects of Fermilab, if you look at each of these federal government installations, um, you know, it was an eminent domain uh, seizure at some point where the state offered up the land to the federal government in order a as a bid for the lab. So Fermilab is 10 square miles, and I think of it as uh, a very important and precious 10 square miles. If you look around the suburbs these days, uh, you can find many examples of Walmart parking lots, uh, sonic drive through uh, overhangs, um, some community uh, parks, some forest preserves, but a lot of it has been transformed. And Fermilab has some of the, the most pristine, original prairie and farmland that's still available in this region. And so that's part of our value proposition. You know, we're here to do great science as a national laboratory, but we're also here to provide a preserve and a park for the community to engage with the laboratory. And I'll come back to that point at the end. But if you look at each of these national laboratories, there's a different way that they interact with their community. And, uh, and what we believe at Fermilab right now is that our land and the ability to freely access the public parts of that on days and weekends and to bike ride and to explore and fish, that's a key part of, of how we actually keep our trust with, with you as our neighbors. Uh, Fermilab right now is about 1,800 employees, so if you've been watching our head count, we've been pretty steady over the past uh, uh, almost decade. Uh, the laboratory used to be a little bit bigger, but we project about 1,800, 1,900 employees over the, next, uh, over the next decade. So that's a reasonable employer in the region. Uh, Fermilab is visited by a community of about 4,000 scientists. So when we do our things, you know, economic impact studies, you, you send a lot of money to an economist and they send you back numbers and you wonder uh, if you got what you paid for. Uh, but there's about 4,000 scientists that actually visit the laboratory each year. And those are people using hotel stays, uh, buying groceries, uh, sometimes using Uber or other the, uh, uh, transportation options. There is a small residen residential area built into Fermilab. Those are for the longer term students, um, and that's only about 250 people. So of these 4,000 travelers that are coming through, they're part of that sharing of, of the intellectual enterprise. Those scientists and students come from about 50 different countries. Uh, so the Northern Illinois is a quite a diverse community, and Fermilab is part of that. We also are home to 25 bison. I was corrected, I thought we were still about three dozen, but it's been a little bit smaller herd and there's currently two bulls and uh, 12, uh, uh, 12 new calves. So our mission, you know, why, why is Fermilab here? Uh, we are a basic science laboratory. So our purpose and what the taxpayer dollars get laundered through the federal system for is to actually pursue basic science. And we focus on discoveries in an area called particle physics. So particle physics is, is the study of the cosmos, but also the study of the very small. So the premise of particle physics is that there's a set of basic building blocks and a set of basic rules that can describe most of the phenomena we encounter in everyday life. There are some limits to those rules, uh, but we think of the basic building blocks. If you remember to some of your high school classes, we have the electron, Circulate, uh, circulating an atom and, and, the and the nucleus consists of protons and neutrons. You might ask what's inside the electron, what's inside the proton and neutron. So that's the realm of particle physics. What gets more and more interesting, and this is part of the revolution in particle physics, is we've been able to take those very elementary rules which seem somewhat uh, uh, crude and maybe at, the, at very microscopic levels and actually use them to make statements about the larger cosmos. So our our understanding, our model for how these basic particles interact and what they should give rise to explains most of the universe, by which I mean about 5%. So you might think that means it's a pretty unsuccessful model if it only explains 5% of the data. However, that 5% is where we live. And so this is where we enter into, uh, entertain things like dark matter and dark energy. 
which we think actually give rise to these much larger cosmological, these astrophysical patterns. Why are galaxies spread out a certain fashion? What governs the movement of those galaxies? Why are they receding from each other? Uh, why do they spin in certain ways? Those are the realms of particle physics that we have not yet uncovered. Uh, but we believe that the basic building blocks with a few basic rules could actually describe that motion. And that's the realm of particle physics, trying to understand a few basic things which we think actually give us insight into the larger phenomena. Now, particle physics does not explain uh, in detail the origin of life or why my daughter prefers pink even though I gave her blue toys, um, but we're working on that. Um, that's chemistry and biology. So as I said, we've celebrated 50 years in, uh, in last year, and it was a year-long celebration, and it was an opportunity for Fermilab both to uh, congratulate its founders and acknowledge everyone who's contributed, but also an occasion to make new friends and build new partnerships. Uh, so I want to really acknowledge the support of the city of Warrenville and the council. Um, Mayor Brummel, Larry Brenner, Leah Goodman, Bill Kukler, John Sauter, Christina White, and especially the support from the Warrenville Fire Protection uh, Fire Department, the Police Department, and Emergency Management. Those three units were essential in organizing uh, the largest open house we've ever had at Fermilab. 10,000 people braved uh, one of the hottest days last summer uh, to visit Fermilab and actually go where we don't normally let the public uh, uh, wander through. Um, we also had a number of different uh, symposiums and, and activities, but you see here the original sign where the town of Weston, before it was turned over to the Atomic Energy Commission, was very proud of being the future atomic research capital. I, I don't think you'll see that sign uh, ever again uh, in the country. Um, but we're proud of those 50 years, and one of the things I'm here to share tonight is, is we're transitioning to the next 50 years. We've been the center of high energy particle physics, and we're now moving to a new frontier. So our connections with Warrenville have been uh, since the beginning. Um, uh, there's uh, currently vendors and businesses in Warrenville that actually Fermilab engages with, so that's to the tune of almost uh, a little over $350,000 uh, last year. Warrenville hotels, restaurants, uh, and other amenities are frequently of service to Fermilab staff and visitors. So we were just discussing, I learned that Family Foods, my local grocery store, used to be called Frank's. Uh, and you'll notice there's there's many uh, Fermilab uh, visitors uh, touring that. Um, we've added a zip car on our uh, property so that uh, staff and visitors can actually uh, use motorized transport to hike through the heat to get the family foods. Um, we're also interested in new housing options. As I mentioned, we have between three and 4,000 people visiting the lab throughout the year, and we have room for about 200, 250 long -term, longer term, I don't mean uh, infinite term, but you know months uh, residents. And so we're interested in how we can uh, sustain those people's visits and encourage them to stay locally as opposed to um, uh, downtown. And as I mentioned, we really do appreciate the support, the involvement, and, uh, and the guidance of the Warrenville uh, uh, City Departments and Agencies. Uh, specifically Public Works, as I said, the police and the Fire Protection District in both supporting our emergency response but also coordinating with us as we do have done a number of exercises over the past year everything from tornado drills to how we might coordinate uh, different resources to uh, scale the high rise or other uh, large buildings to really provide that standard level of community protection across uh, the community. Um, so what I wanna say, the next 50 years, and I, I won't go on at, at great length about this, but it's very exciting. Um, uh, particle physicists are occasionally good at naming things. Uh, this is a large construction project which is headed by an engineer, hence, uh, the somewhat less imaginative name, name, but it's the Long Baseline Neutrino Facility, uh, which is a large engineering construction project, which I'll say something about in a moment, and then the Deep Underground Neutrino Experiment. So this is the part named by physicists. It's got a nice acronym, reminds you of a certain movie, uh, maybe sand dunes in your visits to Indiana. Uh, and then there's also an accelerator, which accelerator scientists are kind of like engineers, so it's called Proton Improvement Plan 2. Again, not the most imaginative name, but at least you can pronounce it, uh, PIP2. So this trio of initiatives is really what will define Fermilab's program for the next 50 years. Now, we're still interested in the cosmos. We're still interested in what's happening with galaxies. We're still interested in what's going on um, uh, with dark matter. 
But this experiment actually proposes to address some of those deep questions. And so LBNF, the engineering project, is actually building the facilities here in uh, near Warrenville, Illinois, at Fermilab, and building some additional facilities far away in South Dakota. And so this connection of the physics connecting Illinois and South Dakota actually reflects uh, what I learned is a, is a deeply rooted historical uh, uh, connection. So the early homesteaders in Illinois, when they got tired of having neighbors, uh, they moved to South Dakota. And so the state constitution of Illinois is actually quite similar to the state constitution of South Dakota. The bison that we celebrate at Fermilab are actually taken from South Dakota stock bison. And so the gene pool of our bison is actually also connected with South Dakota. And of course, uh, many of us have friends and family and our ancestors that moved from Illinois to South Dakota for better agriculture opportunities and then moved back. And so every year when we have our founders picnic where we actually get together with the, farm land, uh, the farmers who actually d contributed their land to Fermilab, there's these South Dakota connections that just emerge in the agricultural history. And here we are sending beams of neutrino particles from Illinois to South Dakota to perhaps win the next Nobel Prize. So it's uh, maybe history repeats or uh, great, uh, great minds think alike. So the one feature that I want to draw attention to here is this project is, is conceived in a way that it will be more international than anything done before in the name of science in the United States. Now that's a bit of an aggressive statement. You can look at something like the space station. Uh, you can look at our current geopolitics and wonder, is this even possible? But one of the beauties of science, and if you visited Fermilab or if you remember some of your classes in school, is that science is a discipline that actually br brings people together. And so you have the opportunity to talk to people that you might have other differences with and actually try to get at the truth of what's happening in a certain situation. So this project will actually bring in hundreds of millions of dollars of contributions from other countries to both Illinois and South Dakota. And that's what makes this an exciting opportunity. This is why uh, the U.S. House of Representatives, the United States Senate, the Office of Science and Technology Policy of the White House, uh, the Office of Management Budget, OMB, the evil part of, uh, uh, of the government, as well as the Department of Energy. Why they're fascinated with this project is they really believe that this opportunity to do something international is so exciting and gives us an opportunity to have a different conversation with the rest of the world. So to give you an example of how we're uh, achieving this, I use the, like, what I call the dinner party analogy. 10, 15 years ago, if I were having a, a dinner party, I might say, uh, dinner at my place, Saturday night, 8 o'clock, please bring the salad, I don't like tomatoes. So it's a potluck, you're bringing something, but I've set all the boundary conditions. And in fact, if you don't like salad, you're kind of stuck, you've got to bring it anyway, if you want to eat you know, what everyone else is cooking. The way we're managing this uh, set of projects is, hey, are you hungry? What are you guys doing Saturday? And that allows us to have that conversation about where's the dinner party, what are we cooking, what should people bring, who's good at what, much earlier, which means they're much more invested, and I use that word literally, they're much more invested in what the outcome is going to be. And that's what makes this project special. Besides, it's also got some killer science. But. So I'm going to try here to give you a brief overview. So this is a video which you will have uh, yours truly narrate. And if I'm on pace, uh, my narration will finish when the video finishes. But you see here, we're at Fermilab. So Fermilab is international, so we'll see our, our country's flags go by. The Proton Improvement Accelerator Project. So this is the new accelerator which will actually power the beam of protons. Uh, this accelerator is actually consisting of a next generation technology called superconducting RF technology. It's something where Fermilab has literally set multiple world records in. These components will be built by India, France, Italy, and the United States. Uh, this will produce a beam of protons which connects with our existing accelerator complex. So Fermilab is a series of seven different accelerators. We're replacing the front end to get a better beam. It then cycles through the main injector and then goes into this new hill. So we'll be adding a, the largest mountain in Illinois, about perhaps 30 feet tall, uh, which will then produce uh, a beam of neutrinos interacting with a target here that then goes straight into the ground. They don't need a pipe. The neutrinos actually will just simply penetrate through the earth. And as you see here from this cross-section, they'll go all the way to South Dakota, where we've actually, uh, we'll be outfitting 
an abandoned gold mine, the world's most productive gold mine, which has been turned off. We will also be sensitive to neutrinos from supernova, which go off in the galaxy. And these underground detectors will be the size of uh, multiple football fields and filled with very cold liquid air, whereupon which they will detect some of those neutrinos from Fermilab and give us a signal, both a light signal and electric signal. And what this will allow us to do is to test the neutrinos when they leave Fermilab and see how they behave when they arrive in South Dakota. And then we'll ship the data to the surface and share it around with the planet. So this collaboration of scientists and students uh, numbers uh, over 1,000 members right now and involves 32 different countries. So this is the future of, of Fermilab as we bring the world together, both here in Illinois and South Dakota. So I invite you to engage with Fermilab. There's different ways to get involved. We have public tours. Check our website. We have a, a large variety of interactive education and public outreach events. So we're not only in the schools, but we invite the schools to Fermilab. Last year, we interacted with about 100,000 uh, members of the public. And that involves everyone from people attending Mr. Freeze to the open house uh, to some of the events uh, uh, on site. Uh, you can come visit our bison. They do, and the, despite uh, the summer heat, they seem to enjoy the plains, and so they're out often. Um, you can do business with us. We have a small business procurement uh, website, as well as our general purpose uh, request for proposals. Uh, we're enthusiastic about connecting with local entrepreneurs and businesses. Um, here's a phone number for our procurement department. You can learn about our science, as I said, attending some of our lectures. Our arts and lecture series continues to be regularly sold out. We bring in scientists and performers from around the country, sometimes around the world. Uh, take a tour. Our 15th floor and our art gallery are open during public hours on days and weekends. Attend some of our lectures. And we have what's called the Outdoor Fair on June 10th, which will actually showcase some of our, our uh, natural activities. Um, we have a website dedicated to sharing opportunities to visit Fermilab. And of course, uh, as I said, you can visit the bison. So again, I want to thank uh, the city of Warrenville, our neighbors, um, uh, patrons, supporters, uh, even some of our skeptics and critics. Uh, Fermilab is an important effort, and we really appreciate your support uh, and your continued involvement. So. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take those, but uh, thank you. Are there any questions? I really, oh, Alderman Davalos. Yeah, when I was at a lecture there, they were talking about the, all the national labs, that this is one of the only ones that's open to the public. Is that still the case, or has that changed? Uh, that's a good question. That's still the case. Fermilab is unique in the fact that the, the gates are basically open to the public with a driver's license. Um, there is no other national lab in the U.S. that has that same open access policy. And that's, we and, uh, oddly enough, uh, if, uh, if I'll be quoted, uh, the federal government believe that Fermilab's openness to the public is fundamental to our success. That's wonderful. And I think that that's a resource we have here in Warrenville that I hope more people know about and take advantage of. All right, uh, Alderman Widener. I'd just like to thank you for being our neighbor and providing our community with so many opportunities. Um, I've also come up with a discovery while at Fermilab. I believe that you have more ticks per acre than any other <laughs> natural area in the world. <laughs> so. You could do I something about that <laughs> with your neutrinos or protons, <laughs> either one. That would be great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. I, I can personally uh, corroborate your observations. Um, my understanding is because of the prairie restoration, we actually do not apply the same, I'll call them treatments, that some of the other municipalities do. But it, it is a uh, trade off, for sure. <laughs> um, yes, the mayor. Tim, thanks so much for an uh, informative and entertaining presentation. We appreciate it. I think I learned more tonight than I, I have in 35 visits in the past w with people that were maybe a little more invested in the science part of it and a little less invested in the, I guess, uh, easy to understand terminology. So we really appreciate that very much. Uh, I appreciate the, the years that you've uh, um, been open to the public. Um, I had actually before you started in Weston, I had a Sunday morning paper route for a while when I was in college, so there's a uh -huh. little bit of history for you. Sure. I've probably ridden my bike on every path in the entire complex. Um, 
at some point you realize that you were probably too open. I really appreciate the fact that you had a, a really nice process to determine how you could remain open on a limited basis without giving people a carte blanche to go wherever they want. So now there are more signs that say authorized personnel only, which I find disappointing because I used to ride down that road <laughs> and now I can't anymore. But I understand and I, and I appreciate the fact that uh, Fermilab for the entire time I've been involved and I've been involved in many um, committees out there uh, has been a, a terrific neighbor to the city of Warrenville and to everyone around here and always been very, very concerned about being a good neighbor. We certainly appreciate that and uh, your open space and what you do for the, for the country and for the world is all very important to us. So thanks for coming tonight. We really appreciate it. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much. <coughs> all right. Uh, other officials and staff comments, starting with the mayor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. First of all, I'd like to welcome our newly minted Administrative Services Coordinator, Alma Morgan. Well, welcome to the staff table, Alma. It's good to see you there. And, uh, a well-deserved promotion, and we'll have a hard time filling your seat that you left open, but we'll do our best, and um, we're excited for what you're going to be able to do in your new position, so welcome. I also wanted to thank uh, Dan Leonard specifically and uh, VFW Post 8081 and American Legion Post 589 for a very, very nice Memorial Day weekend. We had uh, um, a nice ceremony here at our um, Veterans Memorial and then uh, um, Monday we had another nice ceremony, uh, a longer ceremony at the VFW, both of which were very well attended, very well done. And uh, Dan Leonard was certainly the one behind that and made it happen. So, Dan, thank you so much. That was a great thing for the community. Thank you. Other comments by staff or city officials? I have a couple. Um, District 200 is looking for applicants for its Citizens Advisory Commission. Uh, it's a board of 36, which meets eight times a year. You can apply by submitting a very short application, which is available on their website. Um, this committee is not just for parents of school-age kids. They'd like more diversity within the community and a variety of views. So you can call Diana Hutchison uh, with questions or for more information. Her phone number is 630-682-2002 or just look at the District 200 website for more information about that. Um, secondly, uh, I wanted to congratulate uh, the Warrenville Police Department their Cop on Rooftop uh, Special Olympics Illinois fundraiser was so successful that they raised, I believe it's a total of $4,331. Very impressive, so. Uh, great, great work to them. All right, um, moving on to the business of the meeting. Item number one is the consideration to amend the city code, Title III, Chapter Two, the Liquor Control Regulations, which is a Walgreens application for a change in class. And I'm gonna go to Finance Director Dahlstrand on that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ch Chairman, included in your pa pa packet tonight is a request from the Walgreens uh, co Corporation for a change in the liquor license for the Walgreens store located um, basically at Warrenville Road and Winfield Road. We do have representatives here from Wagga Walgreens to answer any qu questions that you may have. They also do have some slides uh, that they can present as well uh, that may assist them with their request. All right, uh, please step forward, state your name, and go right ahead. Good evening. Uh, my name is Rob Anderson. I'm an attorney with the Bar Law Firm for Walgreens. I have with me tonight our general manager of this store, uh, Greg Mackel. Michael Meal, uh, as well as our national director of local government relations, Donovan Pepper. He'll be available to answer questions uh, if there are any. Uh, with the council's permission, I'd like to give a brief presentation on our slides and then open it up to questions uh, that any of you that you may have. So Walgreens opened its first store in Chicago back in 1901, uh, their first pharmacy. So we started out in Illinois. We're currently operating over 8,100 retail stores throughout all 50 states. Uh, we have 580 stores in Illinois, uh, over 580, and more than 480 of those are licensed to sell alcohol. We currently operate 50 stores in the DuPage County area, and 45 of those are licensed to sell alcohol as well. 
this particular location that we're discussing tonight was opened in 2001. Our other location was opened in 2007. Uh, we were licensed for beer and wine sales only back in 2010. We've had no liquor or tobacco violations at this location ever since we received those licenses. Uh, and our request tonight is to add a small section of spirits. Uh, it would be um, 12 feet of spirit space on shelving units to uh, supplement the existing beer and wine space allocations. This would uh, be about 2% of the store's floor area for all the alcohol we would have at the location in, uh, inclusive of the spirits. Our controls for the spirit sales are gonna be very similar to what we have now for beer and wine. Uh, we're gonna make sure we have enhanced training for all our staff so they're aware of our liquor policies, aware of what to look out for uh, in terms of underage sales. We're going to have loss prevention measures such as security cameras and enhanced ID checks uh, for the sale of alcohol. So this next slide shows so the existing floor space and has a couple of areas marked. The area, whoop, the, this area up here is cold beer storage. That's sort of as a reference point to you. We would like to put the spirits in this area right here, which currently houses the wine. Wine would be shifted to the shelves behind there, and then there are some freestanding areas of warm beer uh, along the edges of these caps with three little small displays and then one small one over here. Um, that's the inclusive of the 2% numbers that I gave you before. The spirits would be placed, um, as I said, uh, it would be a 12 foot section of shelving space laid out very similar to this here. This is just a general outline of how we display our spirits at locations that have it. Um, the spirits would be placed and everyone would have to go through the normal sale procedures for any alcohol purchases where they're coming up, getting carded. Uh, the general reason that we're asking for this modification is really a customer enhancement. The store has received requests for people to purchase spirits and the retail space, as I'm sure many of you are aware, has become much more of a one-stop shopping experience. People don't wanna go to multiple stores and if they want to be able to purchase groceries, pick up uh, a pharmacy prescription, and get a bottle of spirits while they're out, they're gonna go somewhere they can do all of those things. If they can only do part of it in our store, that's potentially lost customers for us, lost revenue for us, as well as lost tax revenue for the city of Warrenville potentially, if someone who's right near the border on the store decides they're gonna go to a store outside of Warrenville rather than coming into Warrenville. This isn't something that we think is going to be a massive part of our business, but it's something that because of the one-stop shop nature of the retail space these days, it's an added amenity to the customers and it's something that helps um, drive people to Warrenville to this location to be able to get all their purchases done in one go. So at this point I would open it up for uh, any questions and I'd ask uh, uh, if you need them we can have the general manager or Mr. Pepper come on up. Thank you. Alderman Davlos. Thank you. I just had a question on the, the slide um, that's the general Walgreens history slide. When you're talking about of the 50 stores you have in DuPage County, 45 you say of these stores are licensed to sell alcohol. Mm -hmm. Is that all kinds, including the spirits, or is that just beer and wine? What are you referring to in that that's, sentence? That's all. That's beer, beer wine, and, uh, uh, and spirits as well. Okay, so 45 of your stores in DuPage sell all three. Yes, that's my okay. understanding. And the other thing is, um, in some minutes from 2017, something was mentioned about an alpha lock that can be on these bottles to, so that somebody can't steal them, it would go, until it's removed, there would be an alarm going off if, uh, I do you know anything that about that? I, it wasn't uh, explained in our notes and I, I would just, direct that to Mr. Pepper, he can give you more since information. Since you guys were here, I thought I'd just ask. Sure, good, good evening, Alderman. Uh, Donovan Pepper with Walgreens. With respect to that question, that is, yes, that is a mechanism that we use uh, in certain stores uh, to lock the merchandise. It essentially is a lock, it has to be removed at the point of sale uh, if someone tries to attempt to remove that without it being, the cap being removed, the alarm would go off. It is a sensor, sensormatic uh, type of product. So will that, will, will that be operational at this location? We generally don't use those until we determine that there is some concern 
with that merchandise. If for some reason we see that merchandise is a shrink volume that's being stolen or theft, then we immediately will look at that as an option. But that is usually one that we use only in certain particular areas where we see shrink as a significant problem uh, with that category. Okay, thank you. Okay. Alderman Widener. 12 feet of um, alcohol sales. Was that 12 feet in length or total feet? That's the 12 feet in length of shelf space. Okay, and the height then would be? Six feet? About six okay. feet. Could you give some kind of estimate between cigarettes, beer, wine, and the, the new spirits that you're wanting to sell is 2% of the floor space? What would it be if it was all inclusive with um, those those sale items, beer, wine, cigarettes, and um, spirits? I'll, I'll direct that to Mr. Uh, Mr. Pike. Thank you very much, Alderman. Uh, with respect to that question, I don't know, and I apologize. I don't know the exact linear foot uh, square footage we have devoted to tobacco sales. Uh, in this store, mm -hmm. uh, so I can't speak to that, but it's probably what no more than a the yeah, tobacco nine, itself, nine linear, nine linear feet of uh, tobacco sales or of square footage for tobacco. Okay, thank you. Um, you said you have 8,100 retail store in uh, retail stores in uh, 50 states. Could you describe what kind of philanthropic? Uh, uh, avenues uh, you get involved with in the communities that sure. you uh, have a strong presence in, whether you um, do anything, as I'm sure you've heard some of the volunteer efforts that we had going on in the city of Warrenville. Is there any involvement that uh, Walgreens would would tie into in any of the communities sure. that they're sure. stationed? Sure, and Alderman, thank you for that question. Sure. Uh, as you mentioned, yes, we, we operate in all 50 states, including the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Uh, most recently, we acquired an additional 2,000 stores, uh, the Rite Aid brand stores that we're bringing those stores under the Walgreens banner in about 14 states as well, in addition to those uh, 8,100 stores that are Walgreens branded today. W Walgreens has had a long history of community involvement across the country uh, in the communities that we uh, uh, we we liter we operate stores in, we live in, and we work in. Uh, we, if you recently have been to one of our stores, or at least have watched a television commercial, you was, or even last Thursday night, if you watched television on NBC, you saw one of our big initiatives called the Red Nose Day. Uh, the Red Nose Day is one of Walgreens' largest charity partner, where we raise money to particularly help kids uh, get out of poverty. So we sell products, merchandise, we fundraise uh, locally as well as nationally uh, to support various charities across the country that work at the uh, local level to support uh, kids in poverty. So th that's kind of a broader sense. We do partner with uh, our, our corporate social responsibility efforts across the nation uh, to focus on whether it's uh, healthcare needs, particularly around cancer. Uh, we have a big philanthropic move to uh, support people in need around health care, particularly cancer patients, uh, as well as what we call uh, children's, uh, children's uh, initiatives, uh, Boys and Girls Clubs of America. We support initiatives locally. Um, I know we've been involved in some uh, flu clinics. We sponsor a lot of flu clinics uh, for the senior citizens' homes and a few other events. Is that correct, Chris? And uh, we've done that for throughout our time history here. And there are probably some other things I apologize I can't answer lo specifically locally. But as you know, our two stores that are here in town are we volunteer our time, we volunteer our efforts, and we provide you know products and snacks and water for a lot of events locally. Thank you. Thank you, Alderman. Any further discussion or questions? Alderman Wilson. Just one question, because a couple of years ago, the same question came up relative to your other Walgreens. That's up on 59. And are we, you're interested in calling up that again? Would in future you would be asking to do both of the Walgreens stores or just the one uh, presently located there on Warrenville Road? So currently we're just here on the one on Warrenville Road. 
Um, that's all we're asking for at this time. If we were to uh, seek any changes to the other store, obviously we would approach again through the normal channels, bring it in front of you. You would have the opportunity to discuss and review that matter um, at, at that time should we decide to do that. But we're, we're looking just at this store right now. Any other comments? Any motions? Alderman Barry. I'd like to make a motion to recommend staff draft an ordinance to amend city code title three chapter two to increase the number of class B1 liquor licenses from three to four and a reduction in the number of authorized class B3 liquor licenses from two to one and direct city staff to prepare the ordinances. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Barry, a second by Alderman Bevere. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to item number two, consideration to authorize a pyrotechnic display permit for five alarm fireworks to provide a fireworks display on July 4th, 2018 in the city of Warrenville and authorize Mayor Brummel to execute the fireworks agreement. I'll go to our new administrative services coordinator. Thank you and thank you and good evening. This item is being presented as in previous years as a request to the city council to authorize a pyrotechnics display permit for the annual 4th of July event and requesting that Mayor Brummel authorize the fireworks agreement with the fireworks company. Um, Warrenville Friends of the 4th Committee Chairman Colin Wilkie is here this evening to address any possible questions. Uh, Colin, would you like to come to the podium? Do you have anything you'd like to say about it? Other than it's going to be fantastic, <laughs> uh, it's our, our normal uh, request each year. Uh, we've got a larger display this year. We're working on something that should wow the crowd at the very end. It hasn't uh, come to fruition yet, but we're working on that. Um, again, the weather gods play a big part of that. We, we lost 36 shells last year that did not explode, those are being added to this year's show, so it should be about a half hour long. Pretty spectacular. That's marvelous. I'm looking forward to it. Any questions or comments? There are a couple of typos in this agreement. I don't know if anybody cares about that but before you sign anything there. Alderman Berry. I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council authorize a pyrotechnic display permit for five alarm fireworks to provide a fireworks display on July 4th, 2018 in the City of Warrenville and authorize Mayor Brummel to execute the fireworks agreement. Second. second. Motion by Alderman Barry, second by, let's say, Alderman Davalos. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Uh, and again, back to you for the consideration to approve the closure of certain local streets for the annual Independence Day Parade Route, Parade Staging, and Cerny Park Festival, as stated in the letter from the Warrenville Friends of the Fourth Committee, Chairman Colin Wilkie, dated May 8th, 2018. Coordinator Morgan. Thank you. And again, this is an annual request uh, for the City Council to authorize the closure of local streets for the annual Independence Day event, which includes the parade and the Cerny Park um, celebration. Yes, uh, Alderman Widener. I don't think we'd want to have traffic going in the other direction, so uh, with the parade route, I uh, make a motion to recommend the City Council authorize the closure of certain local streets for the annual Independence Day parade route, parade staging, and Cerny Park Festival as stated in the May 8, 2018 letter from Warrenville Friends of the Fourth Committee, Chairman Colin Wilkie. Second. Motion by Alderman Widener, second by Alderman Zavalos, and a question. Uh, let's go to the mayor. How am I at a couple of people this weekend? Ah, Christina. A couple of people this weekend that wanted to be reassured that the road program would be completed before the 4th of July. 
Um, do we have any um, reassurances <laughs> or assurances <laughs> uh, where we're going to be? Who wants this hot potato? <laughs> I'd be happy to answer that, Mayor. Um, after speaking with the Public Works Department, even if the road is not completed, it will be prepared in such a fashion that it will be safe for the parade and pedestrians. They'll have it cleared so where they can still conduct the parade, even if it's not completed. Okay, so we don't we don't need to worry about that. We do not need to worry about that. Thank you. You're welcome. Very relevant issue. Any further comments or questions? All right, we've got a motion on the floor. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor and Alderman. And thanks for your hard work and the whole committees. Item number four, consideration of tax request to increase the hotel motel grant budget to $150,000 beginning in fiscal year 2020 and approve revisions to the hotel motel grant policy. I'll go to Assistant City Administrator White. Thank you. Um, during the budget prep discussions over the last few months, um, I had mentioned that TAC was reviewing the current hotel motel grant policy and the um, allocation of funds for that grant program um, and would likely be presenting a recommendation to the City Council. Um, TAC Chair Monica Johnson is here with us this evening to present TAC's recommendation to the Council to update that policy and change the allocation of the funding. Good evening to all of you. Uh, recently, TAC has been reviewing the hotel motel grant policy and we'd like to make a few changes. The revised copy of the policy with TAC's recommendations for changes are included in your agenda backup materials. Most of the changes are intended to simplify and clarify the language for applicants and program participants. One key change is tax recommendation to increase the hotel motel funds available for the grant programs from 100,000 to 150,000. In the year 2016, the city council approved increasing the funds for the program to 150,000. However, that was for fiscal year 2018 only. Ironically, fiscal year 2018 ended up being the only year in the past five that our requests were below $100,000. They totaled 90,531 that year. So in the other four of the past five years, TAC has received requests exceeding $100,000 available, the $100,000 that is available for the grant program. And in fiscal year 2019, we received requests totaling $129,795. TAC is recommending an increase in the grant funds to $150,000 beginning in fiscal year 2020. TAC believes the increase in funds would encourage additional programs and events that would benefit the community as well as enhancing our existing programs. This summer, TAC is moving the workshop for grant applicants up to July. We, form, we usually hold that in August but we wanted to allow more time for new applicants to gather the information needed before the September deadline for submitting their grants. We would like to advertise the availability of additional funds in hopes of attracting more programs for fiscal year 2020. So any questions? Well, I'd like to begin by asking uh, our finance director, Dahlstrand, to talk about the budgetary impact and um, and the fund avail availability in the hotel motel tax fund for this request because it's important when you consider increases in spending to consider the revenue and available. So uh, if Director Dalston can address that. Sure, Madam Chairman. Um, annually when we do our budgeting, we do provide projections for all the funds. The hotel m motel fund has actually been a growing fund for any number of years and uh, it continues uh, to look that way going into the f future. It's based on the current existing hotels. I know there's been disc discussion as well about some additional hotels that possibly could occur. While we haven't planned on any of those at, at this point, that would also then uh, add at that point to the availability of the funds um, available for grants. Uh, right now, I think that the fund could easily sustain additional grants out of there. Um, 
and without too 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 much impact, I do want to remind you that we do transfer money out of there uh, to go into the CMRP to fund that that, that as well, and that's three hundred thousand dollars annually that we're doing right now. Thank you. All right. Does anyone have questions, Alderman Wilson? Just a question uh, that, insofar as the funds are concerned, uh, you have down here. I'm looking at the program and <coughs> educational. This is on page three. I guess it's of the original uh, report from your tax grant policy, and the programs for uh, art programs, art exhibits, and art education. And those are all parts of it I, that you've been doing over the years. Now, the committee last year appropriated $30,000 for some artwork to be done. Now, is that all part of your money, that $100,000? Question? <laughs> Assistant City Administrator. Thank you. Um, the aesthetic enhancement program that you're referring to is a separate program altogether from the hotel motel tax grant program. So that $30,000 is separate from the $100,000 that's currently allocated for the hotel motel grant program. So what does, what does the art, where do, what do you use the money out of that $100,000 for? What art work or I, I see two different art things yes. that we're dealing with and I'd just like to know who's paying for what. Mm -hmm. So the um, art programming and education that we're referring to in the policy is for any, um, any groups that bring forward a program or an event that is around art. So an example of some of the past events that we've had is Art on the Prairie, uh, where they bring artists and art exhibits um, out here on Stafford Place. Um, another example is the Historical Society does exhibits uh, around the Albright um, brothers and their um, their artwork and they do educational programming with the children in town and at the schools for the Albright art exhibits. Um, so those are some examples of art programs that have been funded in part by the grant program. Okay, and the library also has various art programs. Do these conflict with those or in conjunction with them or how are, we have a lot of art things then coming from the from the library and from the individuals and community center have art programs for youngsters. And I'm just trying to get a grip around the total art expenditures that we're doing and to see whether or not that extra $50,000 is needed to do some of those. I'd just like to have a clarification on who's paying for each of these exhibits and art characteristics and programs that you want to establish. Okay, um, yeah, the, um, the other programs that some of the other taxing bodies may have um, are up until this point, I believe, have been independent. I don't recall any art-related programs that the library has requested funding on recently. Um, so those programs are independent of the grant program and they're funding those on their end, um, separate of the city altogether. Um, the, as I said, the Art on the Prairie, the Historical Society has some art exhibits and art programs. The Aesthetic Enhancement Program is part of the Hotel Motel funds that are used for that program, but is not part of the grant funding. So that program was established by the council to encourage um, some potentially public art that the city can put in place in different areas in town, um, as well as encouraging other private groups to work with the city on, on public art or other aesthetically enhanced uh, projects. That is a somewhat separate program of the grant policy altogether, where this is, an, is it's established to encourage um, independent groups and um, other taxing bodies, other people in the community to come forward and help and request funds to help them put on a public event or a program or an educational seminar. So while there is um, an option within the grant program for art education and art programming, it is not the only um, option. A lot of the groups that we help fund do events that are not specifically art uh, related, like Fall Fest, for instance, at the with the um, thank you, where the Park District concerts and the Commons that the library puts on. Um, the sports events with Warrenville Athletic Association, thank you. Um, and Warrenville and Bloom is another example of the beautification efforts uh, with the flowers that are help that are funded in part by the grant program. Does that answer the question? Uh, somewhat. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was just that, you know, trying to get the, the whole picture here is because we have allocations. And I know there's a program and a time element 
involved with TAC in getting requests from the individual organizations. And now I appreciate the fact that uh, there's a time element in there. You need to know how much money is going to be available. But just like last year, where we're, we only spent 99000 that we didn't get out, or whatever it was, and I'm yeah, $99,927 or something like that. Uh, but my, my, my question is, is, as long as we don't interfere with the organizations coming to you, we can approve this $50,000 now, or we can do it during a normal budget process for fiscal year 2020. Um, that is correct. So the approval okay. at this stage is really so that we can inform the current applicants and any future um, applicants that those funds are available potentially. Nothing would be formalized until the budget is approved for fiscal year 20. So at any time between now um, and when that budget is approved, that could change and go back to $100,000. All we're looking for at this point um, is sort of an approval that it is the intent of the council to allow us to put that 150,000 aside in the budget that's proposed to you for fiscal year 20, um, and then the final approval for that budget would occur at that time with the budget, with the regular budget approval. Thank you. Yes, and just to emphasize, you know, there's several different approval stages. 2020 seems like a long time away, but for, for something like this, where you have to have the applications in so far in advance, where they then go through the approval process and then once TAC is done with their process, they submit it to us for approval. You know, 2020 is really not that far off in the grant cycle when it comes to this kind of thing. Uh, Alderman Widener was next. It's um, my understanding that with the art enhancement projects that there was a desire to increase that funding so that we could um, create more permanent art in and around or more pieces or expand the budgeting of that. And I just wondered whether the group talked about that in relation to this increase or whether um, it was going to come up at a, at a different time to, for discussion. Um, the group has had some discussions about future funding for the aesthetic enhancement program. Um, because we have just um, really kind of finalized the fiscal year 19, actually fiscal year 18 and 19 projects because they were they were related. Um, we are trying to kind of get our, our arms around finalizing those two projects and looking at then bigger picture um, citywide, what are we looking to do with a public art program if that's the direction that we're going um, so that we can present something more of, co more of a cohesive long-term plan rather than um, potentially one piece at a time. Um, so those discussions, I believe, are going to be ongoing for a while, and I do not foresee anything in the near, near future coming back with a request for additional funds for that program until we figure out what the potentially five to ten year um, plan is for that program. Okay. Thank you. Alderman Ashauer. My, my concern is with the volume of the request for increase. Um, a 50% increase in any budget is significant. Um, and based on the comments I've heard, there has never even been that many proposals. I can see certainly an increase, just not a 50% increase. I would like to see the uh, TAC request be competitive so that rather than who are we going to give how much to? It's who's the best choice of the money that we have allocated. And um, just to comment for our clerk, it is tax dollars. It's called the hotel motel tax. And it does put a burden on the hotels that are here. So it is tax dollars. It's not free money. Um, it's important to me that it be compete, competed for with, with the best choice of events for the community. So I, I disagree with the volume of the request at this time. All right, well, I, I don't want to speak for the clerk, but I think she said Warrenville tax dollars and the hotel motel stays are generally paid by people outside Warrenville. Maybe that was her point. I can't really speak for her. Okay, but just for clarification. Alderman Davalos. Thank you. Are we also voting tonight on the change in verbiage of this, um, of your charter? Okay. Um, 
let me just ask a couple, in that case, let me just ask a couple questions on page three also. So each grant can potentially have four parts. There's the event part and the tourism part and all this kind of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So you'll look, they may not all have, have monies requested in each of those categories, but that's, that's how you look at these proposals, correct? That is correct. Okay, so on page two, they're talking about the event section having a limit of $35,000. That is just for the event criteria, which you have one, two, three, four, five different line items under that on page three. Um, that is not exactly correct. So yes, while it does say all event grants are limited to 35,000, in that case, we're using event grants in the broader sense of and the, the total event, uh, sorry, the total grant itself cannot be more than 35,000 for any one applicant. Okay, total. that's kind of what I was getting yes. to. All right, okay, that's, that's fine. Um, okay, that's my question, thanks. Thank you, other questions, comments? If I understand the, the impetus of this request, it's to try to grow the program a little bit to see if we can get some more interesting and valuable events for the community so that people can stay in town, enjoy their community, and not have to go somewhere else. And I appreciate that. I think the fund is, is uh, doing well. We can afford to do this. It's important to provide things for people in the community so they don't have to leave the community. And perhaps one of the reasons that we've had fewer applicants in terms of volume over the years is they, people were aware that there was a very intense competition. There's only X amount of dollars and we always use up that amount or pretty close to it. So perhaps people didn't apply because they didn't think the money was available. Uh, so it might be a good idea to put this in. I mean, I support the idea to put it in, in, in the event that it may encourage others to come forward with good uh, programs and events for the community. Certainly you do a terrific job of vetting all of these. Not all of them have been successful. It would be nice to get some new things. Again, in the interest of keeping people in town, uh, drawing people from outside of town uh, to come to enjoy our community. Um, so I would support this. Again, if something changes between now and then, that it always can be pulled out of the budget later, but it's nice to at least to allocate that money now and be able to use that to attract um, new events. Alderman Davalos. Yeah, just one more clarification. So last year the applicants, it was around $129,000, so you had, to, you had to say no to some things. Um, I always admired the sort of rigorous um, criteria and process that you have of actually looking at these, um, not only requiring um, a lot as an organization or group makes an application, but they also have to write a report afterwards and I mean, it's not, it, you have to really be committed to your cause, I think. Um, so I'm wondering, since we've never, at least in my experience, had the whole $150,000 used, will there still be a rigorous process? And even though you may have the money, you may say no just because you feel that criteria wasn't met or it's whatever you guys in your experience. Because um, I am sort of resonating with Alderman Ashour's comment about um, having it be competitive, having it be the best. Um, and again, I have admired the process so far, so I kind of don't want that process to change necessarily. Well, I'm thinking, um, in speaking to that, uh, um, I'm thinking about fiscal year 18 where we didn't have um, requests that even equaled 100,000. And we still went through all of the applications as if, you know, we did meet well, the, sa the same exact way. And there were things that we cut, even though we could have made it easy and in September gone, okay, it adds up to this, we have this much money, they all get everything that they asked for. But we didn't do it that way. We met, you know, through till December to make those decisions going through each thing and making sure that everything that they asked for um, was even allowable within our policy. So, um, I'm, I'm not worried at all about, you know, just having a free for all, you know, with, um, you know, extra, uh, extra money, but, um, additional funds because we're, you know, very judicious with that. And we have a, a really good process that, that I'm confident in. So 
I think, um, you know, part of what, um, it was the mayor, I think, who said that a lot of people might think, oh, you know, we, ha we do have a lot of repeating grant applicants, and we do, um, a lot of them ask for a, a large chunk of money because the largest amount that they can ask for is 35000 and we have um, a maximum of 100000 So three of them asking for that, and that's the end of that, and we might have one sport, one music, and one art type event, and we try to have a variety of things because everybody doesn't, you know, gravitate toward the same type of activity. So we try to, um, you know, really make sure that we have something for everybody, young people, older people, you know, families, everything. So I think the more, um, the more that people, well, it's hard, it's kind of the chicken and the egg thing. People aren't maybe necessarily thinking of new things because it's, you know, it's allocated almost already. So, um, you know, if people think, you know, I love all the activities in the city, but we're missing this one category that our family always goes to this city for, and maybe we could bring that to our city if there was, you know, funds to start something like that. So, so that's kind of our, our thought that, you know, we've, we've had, we have a wonderful program, thanks to all of you for, um, you know, setting this money aside from the hotel motel tax. And because it's been so successful and we're confident in our process, we feel like we're, you know, ready to have it grow a little bit. Thank you, because I'm confident in your process also, and so I'm glad to hear you say that that will continue that way, because I think that's the best, and, and um, yeah, so thank you. Yes, it's great to hear you say that, Mrs. Johnson, because I, I really am not worried at all either. I'm, I'm very confident in the hard work that TAC has done over the years to ensure the continued viability of this program and the strength of this program. You know, not everything that is um, funded in the grant is a tremendous success and comes back the next year. You know, sometimes you have a relatively small new idea. And I, I'm thinking, you know, sort of somewhat recently of the concerts on the comets that just were wildly popular. And I can't see that ending anytime soon. I think it's, you know, been a tremendous success. And I hope they do come back every year. So sometimes having the same applicants again is not a problem at all. It means that this, this idea was a good one and it was very well received by our community. And, and I think because of the success of the um, concerts on the commons, the library then added the Sunday afternoon matinee concert. So new things grow out of the success of the existing programs too. That's an excellent point. All right, anyone wanna make a motion? Alderman Perry. I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council approve the revised hotel motel tax grant policy and authorize staff to include $150,000 in the hotel motel tax grant program funding beginning with the FY 2020 budget. Second. Motion by Alderman Berry, second by Alderman Davalos. Further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion Eight. carries. Oh, sorry, motion carries. Thank you. Item number five is an informational update on the compensation study, phase four. Assistant City Administrator White. Thank you. Um, we recognize that it's been a little while since we've had an update on the compensation study. So the information that was included in the backup uh, for your agenda this evening was intended to kind of give a uh, brief summarization of the four phases of the project that we've undertaken up until this point and where we are uh, with the completion of phase four, which was the um, the salary survey the, um, based on the new list of comparable communities that was previously approved. Um, we did experience some delays going through phase four due to some turnover um, on both our consultant team and uh, within the city um, that um, unfortunately, again, created some delays with this with this phase of the project. But at this point, we have completed most of the work on phase four. We are now at, um, at the stage where the compensation work group is getting together to discuss the implementation of compensation uh, of the compensation strategy, given all of the new information that we've gathered over the four phases of the project, and putting together a um, recommendation for the council on. 
uh, on the implementation of the compensation study results and um, what the impacts of those changes may be citywide for our compensation plan. Um, so we had a meeting. We are planning to have another one uh, likely in June um, to have continued discussion on that, and hopefully we will have a recommendation before the council very soon. Okay, and what sort of form do you expect that recommendation to be in? Um, it will likely be um, a summarization of all of the data points from the four phases of the project at a public safety and finance committee meeting. Okay, so then at the end of this whole process, once it's complete, you know, we'll have a workable document with the compensation plan. For that the is the goal, yes. Okay, that sounds great. Uh, this is an informational only item, but if there are any questions, now is the time. All right, seeing none, we'll move to item number six. Consideration of the contract renewal for the city prosecutor services with Christine Turkowitz, Chief Toronto. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm bringing this forward. Christine Sharkowitz has been our city prosecutor for a number of years. She does an outstanding job. And included in the backup agenda uh, packet, uh, there is a letter from uh, Ms. Sharkowitz as well as a uh, proposed contract. One of the things to note uh, in item number one of the, the contract uh, and also in the letter is that the uh, fees have not changed for this upcoming year. Uh, Ms. Sharko which charges us $180 per court session uh, for which he prosecutes local ordinances. Uh, additionally, in the event that the court session would last longer than two hours, there's no additional increased fee. Um, she charges $100 for any phone consultation uh, with defense attorneys, defendants, witnesses, uh, research or trial prep and done, done in conjunction with uh, prosecuting Warrenville cases and uh, she will do $140 per hour fee for uh, telephone consultation, correspondence research, document or trial prep done uh, in conjunction with the prosecution of the uh, city building code violations. As I've indicated before, um, Ms. Sharkowitz has done a, a tremendous job and this agreement that's before you will be effective from June 1, 2018 until May 31, 2019. And if you have any questions, happy to answer those for you. Anyone with questions? Alderman Barry. Seeing no questions, I would like to um, make a motion to recommend the City Council approve the contract renewal for City uh, Prosecutor Services with Attorney Christine Charowitz for the period of June 1st, 2018 through May 31st, 2019. Second. Motion by Alderman Barry, second by Alderman Davalos. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. <coughs> Item number seven is the consideration of a request to dispose of city property, specifically AR-15 rifles. Chief Toronto. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, in the FY 2019 fiscal budget, the City Council approved uh, $18,888 for the purchase of 17 new AR-15 rifles. Uh, the reason for this purchase is the inventory of rifles that we had was aging. Uh, they were also of different manufacturers, which necessitated different type of parts replacement and also the tech or the um, the uh, skills and training to be able to, to work on these different rifles, and also the fact that these are more of a recreational type uh, weapon as far as quality is concerned. Uh, we were able to obtain a quote from Lewis Machine uh, uh, Tool Work through Keesler's Police Supply uh, for a purchase of 17 of their rifles. These were at rifles have a manufacturer's suggested retail price of $2,400 a piece. Uh, they were being offered to us at a cost of $1,362.50. Um, Lewis Machine and Tool Works is a central Illinois-based company. Uh, additionally, they are also willing to train six of our, our officers as armorers so that they would be able to uh, disassemble, clean, maintain, replace parts, and safety inspect these uh, weapons done uh, at the Warrenville Police Department so the rifles would not have to be sent out. 
on page one of the, uh, the memo from Deputy Chief Jacobson, there's a breakdown of the trade-in value. Um, they were going to uh, be giving us, say it is Keesler's uh, Police Supply, which is a federal firearms licensed dealer. Uh, they were going to be giving us a, a discount of $4,275 uh, that would be subtracted for the original amount of purchase of the rifles of $23,162.50. Um, the $4,275 is broken down uh, based on the amount they were giving for trade-in of, of each rifle. Now, what we have done is we've done in the past um, – Keesler's is willing to sell these back to members of our police department. We cannot conduct this transaction as the city of Warrenville is not a federal firearms dealer. Uh, Keesler's police supply is. Uh, this would be a private transaction. Um, an informal survey that we took at the police department indicated that all 17 of these rifles would be purchased by uh, current full-time Warrenville police officers. Uh, the buyback program would be the trade-in value plus the officer would have to pay an additional $50 to Keesler's uh, plus Illinois tax. Um, we would be recommending this course of action as it allows us to get a quality product for the police department that would have a service life in excess of 25 years and the current weapons uh, would be safely disposed of by going to uh, vetted police officers that would use these uh, for training uh, on their off-duty time. And I'll be happy to answer any questions if I can for you. Alderman Perry. Well, I'm happy to see that the, um, uh, the these guns would be um, purchased by our police officers, but is there any guarantee that this would happen? I know they said that they would do it, but um, I just need to have, I guess, some kind of guarantee that they would buy them and that they wouldn't go someplace else. I mean, if one of them backed out and said, gee, I don't want to get, buy this now, um, you know, then I don't want Keesler's to be then in control of what happens to that gun. The survey we took was on a first come first serve basis. There were a number of individuals that were waiting in the wings to purchase them that weren't able to. Uh, and the only thing I can tell you from past experience is that everybody that has uh, indicated they wanted to make these types of purchases has done so, even though the transaction is conducted through uh, the business and the individual officer. Okay. I, at first, I didn't even, I was willing to pay the difference and not have these guns go anywhere <laughs> and just have them melted down or whatever needs to be done with them. But as long as um, uh, police officers are in control of them, I, I don't have a problem with that. Thank you. Yeah, I've, I've discussed this with other people in Warrenville, too, and Warrenville residents are comfortable with the idea of Warrenville police officers purchasing these sorts of professional weapons, but uh, um, otherwise I would absolutely agree with Alderman Barry and prefer that the city not receive a minor amount of trade-in value and have the guns destroyed instead. But given this situation, I think we can be comfortable. Any other questions? Yes, Alderman Widener. Make a motion to recommend the city council approve an ordinance authorizing the disposal of city-owned property through trade-in with Keesler's police supply and request the city attorney draft an ordinance for disposal of said property. Second. Motion by Alderman Widener, second by Alderman Wilson. A question, Alderman Zavalos. Yes. Every time you tell us something, Chief, I learn something new. So I just had a couple questions to sure. continue to learn something new. So. When I, I am totally in favor of having um, these officers have the same weapon, um, just for all the reasons that were stated in the memo. I, I think it must be very difficult to have different weapons and you're moving fast and just maintaining them. I, it just makes so much sense that you're doing this. So that part I'm totally in favor of. When a weapon is destroyed, l let's say there was no buyback program. What ha do they melt these weapons down? Do they cut them up and recycle the metal? How are guns taken out of use permanently? In, in the past, when we've had court orders, say, for evidence, or somebody's turned in a weapon and they've wanted it destroyed, uh, we'll turn it over to the state police, and uh, essentially they'll do a couple of things. Depending on the type of the weapon and the size, it can either be melted down at a smelting facility, or you can use a bandsaw. Um, that obviously would have a carbon blade and be able to 
cut it into a number of pieces so that it would be inoperable. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I'm in favor of, of this proposal, but unlike some of the others, I, <laughs> and I'm glad that it's our police officers who I trust so much um, would have these weapons, but given my druthers, I would rather get rid of 15 of these guns, if you want my opinion, just because I think it's, it's uh, I, I just think still about parents that are struggling and trying to wonder if it's the next day they're gonna see their kids and all that's going on that I don't have to explain to anybody. To know that somehow we planted a pole and just said, we're gonna take 15 of these semi-automatic weapons uh, out of circulation, somehow it seems like the right thing to do but now that you propose this other, um, this, this buyback, which wasn't what we talked about before, so it is a, an improvement. I'm not gonna vote against it. I just, I feel sometimes so impotent on these, these school shootings, and I, I just, there's, I feel like there's nothing anybody can do. And it just seemed like for a minute this afternoon, I thought, wow, what if Warnerville could take 15 of these guns out of circulation? Anyway. I will be voting yes for this, but I and thank you for your answer about how how they are destroyed. I, I appreciate that. I have a question, uh, which has to do with the, the framing of the request. This is only um, a disposal of property. It's not specifically the authorization to buy the new rifles, or it's both in one. No, it's it's uh, the the rifles since they came in under the twenty thousand dollar decision package with the trade in value, which in my experience since I've been here in my 12th year, um, we've always looked and taken that into consideration when we were preparing a purchase or uh, whether or not to submit a decision package was if there was gonna be a trade-in value or some type of buyback for the current property that the city owned. So the purchase of those weapons, the monies have already been approved and set aside in the FY 2019 budget. However, if we were to make that purchase, we were going to have these items of city property that had to be disposed of. And therefore that was going to take council approval in order to um, accomplish that. Okay, so if the disposal of the items hadn't been approved, then we'd have to come back and do a separate request for the larger than $20,000 purchase. I defer that to the administrator. Yes. Thank you, city administrator. Wonderful. <laughs> Alderman Hoffman. Yeah, I agree with what you're doing here, and um, I, I support our Constitution and also our Second Amendment. Um, <coughs> is there any way you can sell them to Alderman? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Mayor. Chief, just a question on the new AR-15s for, you know, public information. These are purchased for the, for the purpose of when would they be deployed, where are they kept, uh, you know, give people an idea of why we have these weapons. They're in our patrol cars. They're out on the street with our officers every day. Um, if they're not in the car, for some reason the car is being serviced or what have you, we have an armory in the police department uh, that is locked and has as access codes that are only available to a few individuals that would be able to gain access to these. When they are in the cars, they're in secure locking devices that um, unless you have a key to open or you know the location of a release button, which we don't ever give that out, you would not be able to access these weapons. Um, and that's what we're kept. And, and to be really honest with you, we wish we didn't have to have these and we wish we didn't have to carry them. But unfortunately, um, many of the situations that we put our officers in, they're facing this type of weaponry. So I believe it's only um, prudent and professional to uh, make sure that they're on equal footing when they're confronting these types of threats. But the public can be assured that they're very carefully secured and not available to anybody who might. Decide. Absolutely, we, we, we train a half a dozen times a year and uh, on our sidearms and the rifles and uh, the biggest thing that is drilled into uh, every 
professional police officer who has to handle weapons as a matter of their their daily life is is safety is is paramount. Great, thanks, Chief. Sure. Alderman Ashour. Just a question out of curiosity: when when did we transition from shotguns to rifles? They were here when I got here, so I think it, sometime I think these rifles were 15 years old, so I, I would just... Yeah. You know, but it's an obvious, there was a reason for it, and it's because the officers needed the protection and the upgrade. Greater firepower and a couple of other things. Number one, there were less liability for the city. A double-odd buck shell has nine thirty-two caliber pellets uh, in a shotgun shell, where if you expend that, you have nine projectiles that you're discharging at one time. Um, they're not as accurate. Uh, and they're a lot harder to, uh, to accurately fire because of the amount of recoil uh, than the 223 caliber. So it's a higher capacity weapon that's easier to reload, that's more accurate because of the sighting systems on it, and uh, it also has one projectile and only one projectile alone that is discharged. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think we can all agree that it's a professional weapon that should be available only to professionals in an ideal world. All right, I believe we already have a motion. So unless there's any further discussion, and I don't see any, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Item number eight is a consideration of a request to purchase four replacement police department vehicles. Chief Toronto. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, this would be covered in the capital maintenance and re um, replacement program to purchase four police vehicles, one administrative vehicle, and three marked patrol vehicles. Um, there is a description of each car that would be replaced in a memo from Deputy Chief uh, Jacobson uh, to myself and the administrator. Um, the total cost for all of these vehicles, I believe, is 83000 oh, $111,587. Uh, they're being purchased through the, uh, the state um, purchase agreement, uh, I believe out of Curry Motors, and um, a description and an inventory of all the uh, equipment that's on the vehicles has been spelled out as well as uh, the vehicles that are currently being replaced with the amount of mileage and and uh, what have you about those particular vehicles. But um, I'll be happy to answer any questions if I can. Thank you. Uh, anyone else with questions? Treasurer Brunner. The amount to uh, bring it into public works to put the additional equipment, that's a separate line item? We're using a different company right now. We're using a private vendor to put in the radios, uh, the overhead lights, the grill lights, the sirens, and, and what have you. Uh, if you notice, these come all pre-wired. Right. So the wiring is all there. It's just a matter of uh, this vendor is able to turn them around much quicker so we get them out on the street. We're getting the cars now uh, an average of one per week before... Uh, because of the amount of work they had down there and with only one individual, it was taking sometimes uh, three weeks or longer to get a vehicle turned so around. So that'll be a separate line item then? That's correct. Those monies have been purchased, in, or excuse me, those monies have been uh, allocated already um, in, in the FY19 budget. To well, do right, but the I guess the question is that's not considered a, the via part of the vehicle. No. Even though, even though it will be part of the vehicle later. As far as? It, it's the labor to attach the emergency lights and what have you, yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so the total cost that we're going to invest in these vehicles is going to be greater. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, my question is, we're going to be replacing uh, two Ford Tauruses here with Ford Explorers. Uh, I think that's a sedan being replaced by an SUV. That's correct. Uh, so what about um, additional costs for fuel? We had talked about this before. There's about a 300, uh, 380 pound difference in the weight of the vehicle between the sedan and the uh, the SUV, and I believe it was one and a half to two miles per gallon. That uh, the sedan's got better mileage. Uh, they're they're the same size engine that they're putting in. It's just the weight's a little bit different. 
Okay, so we've now replaced several smaller vehicles with the larger vehicles, and you know, overall our, our vehicle fleet efficiency is just continuing to drop, right? As I, I'm, I'm not the, sure I the understand. The fuel efficiency of our vehicle fleet is continuing um, to drop as we get bigger and bigger vehicles. Well, it, the reason that we went away from the sedans was basically a safety factor in that we could not get two officers in there in the event when we had to train new police officers. Um, so we were kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place with, you know, what do, what do we do with these other individuals? Additionally, uh, the back seats of the, S or of the sedans was small I, as far as getting somebody that a suspect that was under arrest, getting them in there. Um, a lot of police departments, major cities that are still running the sedans, they have transport vans. Um, so those officers that are working a zone or an area, they're not transporting prisoners, they're calling for a wagon uh, to come and pick a prisoner up. So this was the basic reason we went to those. And, and the majority of your suburban police departments, if you know, they're, they're, they're using that crossover or SUV type vehicle. All right. And um, the fuel that we use, um, it's not like these are hybrid vehicles where they can get better gas mileage. And it's not like these are... Um, E85 vehicles where they can use. No, no, they're not dual fuel. They're not. Yeah, I don't believe so. So even though we have access to that kind of fuel in theory, we're not planning to use it. I don't know that there have been tests run by police departments on E85, E85 or alternative, or if there are, I haven't seen any on it. Um, I just think it's a matter of it, we're, we're doing it because that's, kind of what everybody does right now and the availability to be able to get fuel in the in the event that uh, the officers were out of the jurisdiction here and had to fuel a vehicle like our detectives or what have you um, that they wouldn't be reliant on having to go to a specific place to get to get fuel for the car right because the, the fuel costs of our vehicle fu fleet are non-negligible you know when a patrol officer is is out the vehicle's running the whole time um, obviously not every patrol officer is driving at high speeds the whole shift or anything like that. But these, these vehicles get a lot of use. There's a lot of driving and a lot of uh, gas being used. And so fuel costs is something we should consider. It's a budgetary issue, and it's also an environmental issue. So it's just dis disconcerting a little bit that that's not uh, in any way factored into any of the costs that you've presented or going forward plan to present when we keep making these same shifts in the same direction to less efficient fleet and our our fuel costs are going to go up as a result so it just seems like that's something that could be presented um, in the bigger picture discussions about vehicles for all city uh, departments <coughs> alderman nashauer it, it's uh, apparent to me that when i see the officers we just saw some of the vfw event with the amount of equipment they have to wear I guess I would challenge any anybody here on the council to gear up just like them and then spend every day in that car. And it, you'd easily see the value just plain in how somebody might be able to better function with a little bit more room that type of car affords them. Um, for the little bit of trade-off in fuel, it's huge for the mental health of the officer. Alderman Wilson. I'd like to make a motion to recommend the City Council approve the purchase of four police department vehicles in the amount of $111,587 through state contract number 152. Second. We have a motion by Alderman Wilson and a second by Alderman Davalos. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. All right, moving on to item number nine, consideration of a water and sewer rate increases. Um, Finance Director Dahlstrand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chairman, during the 2019 budgeting process uh, and working with the uh, Deputy Public Works D Director, it was determined that we needed to recommend both water and sewer rate increases for this fiscal year. Uh, the water rate increase would uh, would be a three percent increase. The some of the 
reasons for that are outlined in your mem memo, but I'll point, point them out for, for those who obviously cannot see that m memo. It includes um, inspections for all of our elevated w w water storage tanks, uh, re re repainting of water t towers, and removal of the Bauer ground st 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 storage tank and the resulting s system modifications that that would require. Um, on the sewer side, we've recommended a 5% increase as well. The reasons for that um, have a lot to do with the I and I pro 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 program that the De Deputy Public Works Director ha has been speaking to you about for quite a while now, uh, the, as well as just increased co co costs we have from the uh, city of Naperville, who does all our tree 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 treating of all of our wastewater. The uh, I will po point out also the last water increase, uh, which is certainly not a reason to increase. Rates, but I do want to point, point out the last water increase rate was in 2013. The last sewer rate increase was in 2014. Included in your backup is an estimate of what we what we project the estimated cost would be for a, um, a homeowner, or, or um, I'm sorry, a system user um, with with someone that has a four family household. Uh, it would be about thirty four dollars and. 50 cents per year in the combined rate increases for, for, for them uh, going forward. Okay, and as you can see in this chart, there's you know smaller but not exactly linear um, uh, estimated change for smaller families and also larger uh, estimated changes for larger families as the use goes up, but there's also some flat charges in there as well. Correct. There was both a commodity charge and a base charge as well. We've also inclu included some comparative rates to show you how other communities look uh, in comparison to Warrenville or, or, or how we look compared to them as well. It's based on information from uh, the DMMC who does annual s s surveys of, of, of uh, municipal ta tax rates and revenues. Uh, Warrenville by this um, has the S second lowest combined rate overall of all the commu communities that were um, in that survey, and there was uh, approximately 17 of those. So we, we still rank well below everybody else as far as our combined rates. Right, and, and well below everyone else. Well below water. everyone else. Well below everyone else except West Chicago for the combined weight, and well below everyone else for water by you know factors of four in some cases Correct. and more. I will point out also that this the um, users would not see this increase until the bills first produced in July. We have not billed for any w water yet that was you uh, utilized by our residents in May at all. Um, our our current so software does not even allow us to s split that ac accordingly. So we wait until the first time that we can actually hit full months of, of billing before we even do any of that. So there's. Uh, a little bit of time before that hits. So we are building a delay in Correct. after this decision. And we've, oh. done, we've done that same thing with any other increase that we've had in, pre in prior years. That's right. Any questions or comments? Alderman Widener. Will there be additional communication to the residents that uh, this is coming or will they find out when they receive their first bill that there's an increase? No, it'll be on the website society site as well because we do pu put our rates on there as well. We can also put a newsflash on uh, the website as well. And, uh, and also once Channel 10 gets back up and running, it would be on there as well. Thank you. That'd be great. All right. I suppose we could put it on the Facebook page. It's not the sort of thing. It's like, yay, on the Facebook page, but it is an important piece of information for people. It's not exactly the type of stuff we try and promote in the online discussion about Warrenville, but it's something people need to know. Alderman Davalos. We have two questions. Um, one is just a clarification question. So only very few communities, two or three, do this base rate and then... Correct. Were you around when that strategy was... I mean, wha why so few are doing that? And so my question is, why are we doing that as opposed to putting that cost back just into the per thousand gallons, is it? You know what, I, in all honesty, I inherited that idea. Okay. Um, I, the way we look, we look at it is that, that that's what's actually paying for the system maintenance itself long term. 
where the commodity rates are, are charged or are paying for what you're actually using. Okay. Um, I'm glad you mentioned the I&I &I because that's, when they explained those costs, it was a little frightening <laughs> over a long period of time. So I'm glad that everyone's planning for that. My other, uh, my last question is, um, I don't know what page I'm on here, but the page that talks about the reserves, the reserve balance that originally, I suppose, came out of Cantera. And if, as you look at that going year to year, it's looking like we've gone from nine million and by 2021 will be $760,000. I'm assuming that's not so scary because I'm assuming that the build out, are you thinking that the build out of the, Areas that are not do not have water and sewer will be done by then because I know a lot of that money was used for that. The majority of what that has been used for is to extend the utilities into areas that not pre pre previously had right. service, and we're we're sort of getting down to, to to the end of that. And which is not to say that everybody has sewer water, but but cer certainly the vast majority of that has already been done, or is in the prior pro pro process of being done. So that would come to an end. Here it's like it'll never never come. I don't think to a complete end, but but certainly more so than it has been in recent years. Okay, thank you. I'm going to go to Administrator Copley to follow up on some of that. Okay, thank you. I'm just going to enhance some of the responses that our finance director just gave to your questions. Uh, the base charge, just to go back to that one first question, uh, exactly as Kevin said, but it's it was based on a uh, philosophy years before I think anybody on any of us worked here or, or around the council, of course, uh, that even if somebody traveled, they were snowbirds and they go to Arizona for the entire winter, they're still connected to the system and there's a cost to the city to maintain the system, the maintenance uh, uh, costs, it has to be maintained just for the purpose of, of somebody being able to be there to have that water access so when they return home, then they have the water available again. And it didn't, uh, uh, philosophy, and this is uh, one of those um, tales that is passed down verbally. So I don't know if it's actually written someplace in the history, maybe in the original ordinances when those were adopted, probably in the 70s. Uh, but it was uh, just a fairness thing that it shouldn't be on the, all the rate payers on the commodity charges solely to pay for the entire system when some people weren't carrying their portion of it. So that's why that's there is just to cover those costs. Um, I was gonna also comment on the second question, now it slipped my mind. It was the just the reserve fund balance, Reserves. thank you. Just to enhance what, uh, uh, Kevin was just saying, at the time, most of that money uh, did come from Cantera, all the tap-on fees that the city didn't need to use because under the TIF agreement, redevelopment and financing agreement for Cantera, the developers were, were paying for those costs and then charging them as they sold the land, et cetera. So the city did, in effect, have uh, what would be maybe considered a windfall from that. The council made a uh, decision in the early, or very early 2000s to use that money to extend the water and sewer system, as you were discussing, uh, to all the areas of town that were not served. So it was a major benefit for the community. Recognizing, though, trying to sit there and look 15, 20 years ahead when that entire, that was a massive undertaking. It's one of the most quiet, very large public works projects undertaken in this area, but um, that's how we do things here. We just get them done. Um, recognizing that the money might run out before we got all of it done, but at least they could do a, a great majority of that work and it looks like the way we've extended that money and, and utilized it we've gotten to the end of that whole process so I didn't want to let that go with just the very correct technical answer um, that was something that the council had the foresight to do years ago the city had the foresight to do and did an excellent job of everyone hasn't tapped onto those services that are available but they are there when they're ready to their systems septic system fails or their well fails they can go into the city utilities now and 20 years ago, that was not the case. So I just wanted to add those comments to what was said. Thank you. And, and one other thing I noticed just looking at the, the backup material is that the first two uh, fund balance items have an asterisk next to them that says, as adjusted for net capitalized assets. So I'm not sure we're comparing apples to apples when you look across that row. Well, when we do the budgeting, there's no way to foresee at the time where we'll be at the, the, the end of the year. So I do expect these f figures to adjust somewhat, but I can't tell you at budgeting time exactly what that will be. So when we go ahead and we project the, the actuals for those, that's when we use and go and put that asterisk in to show that it has been ad adjusted because by then we know the answer. Yes, so I think that helps answer the question a little bit too. 
knowing what the numbers are as opposed to estimating. Alderman Pavir. It's just a question uh, about the rates going up now and I know we have to put in like an overflow tank at some point. We haven't a budget for property. Um, will that be affecting the rates again by constructing the tank or is that something that's just gonna be uh, in, into the budget? Going for, for, for forward, we would anticipate that there will be the need for additional increases at some point in the future. How much it is at this point, we do not know um, the direct impact of that, of that land purchase was built into this year's budget. Uh, so there, but, but there will likely be additional costs going for, for forward um, as, we, as we look into other years when we budget as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. And just to follow up on that, you know, I and I costs, we can project what they're going to be, but until they actually start doing the repairs, until we see what those actual costs are gonna be, we don't know what they're going to be. That's correct. And just to reiterate, this is an enterprise fund and the fees have <coughs> to cover the expenses for it. So, you know, whether or not to, to raise the rates is to some degree going to be taken out of our hands and it's going to be a question of how much we're going to have to raise the rates to perform the necessary maintenance and repairs. I will point out, Madam Chair, Chairman, if I can, I, we've used the EMRP, and as you, call, as you recall, you were part, part of helping establish that. That's partially how we look to, to determine what rates we need to do. Um, we are looking at an alternative uh, to supplement what we've done with that EMRP to help more directly determine rates going forward. So that's one of the things we'll, we'll be looking at um, for, future years as a more predictable way, uh, or not predictable is the word I want, but a, a more uh, accurate way to determine longer term future needs of any rate increases that we may need. Yeah, I mean, it's not fun to raise rates. None of us wants to raise Absolutely rates. Absolutely not. Uh, but raising rates in a predictable way is better than doing it very erratically and having the long term plan so that people can have confidence that it, their money is being spent wisely and that the appropriate maintenance is being done to avoid massive costs later on. Um, you know, that gives us at least some reassurance. Further questions, comments? Alderman Hoffman. Yeah, I was just wondering what um, effect does the $2 million um, that was borrowed out of the sewer water fund um, that hasn't been paid back yet that um, affect this rate? It has no impact because that 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 money uh, is just cash from one pocket to the other. It's a receivable in the water and sewer fund, so it's it's still an asset in that fund. So there's really no no impact on that at all. Okay, thank you. Further discussion, comments, questions, motions. <coughs> Alderman Wilson. I'd like to make a motion that the city council approve a 3% water rate increase and a 5% sewer rate increase effective May 1st, 2018 and direct staff to prepare the ordinance. Motion by Alderman Wilson, second by Alderman Barry. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Moving ahead to item number 10, an informational update on the status of the ERP implementation. Um, that information is in the packet. I don't know if there's any presentation about it, but if anyone has any questions about the information in the packet, this is the time. All right, that's not an action item, so we'll move to item 11, an update on the administration, finance, and police department fiscal year 2019 work plans. Uh, again, this is an informational only item. There's information in the backup materials about all of those items. So if you have questions, this is the time. Seeing none, uh, item number 12, an update on the administration and finance decision packages. Uh, fiscal year 2019, no, going backwards. Any questions? All right. Um, next item under miscellaneous is the commendations section. We have commendations here for several different people in the police department. Uh, there were some very nice letters 
There were some um, neighboring police departments that thanked us for assistance, the city of Wheaton, the city of Elmhurst, um, some citizens that wanted to thank officers for their professionalism, even professionalism of officers that wrote them a speeding ticket, um, it looks like. So that's all great to see and much, much appreciation to our police department. Alderman Davalos. Lots of appreciation to our police department. Not just these letters, this was a delight to read. But I hear this all the time. I, I just think they are well trained, they, I, I don't know what it all comes down to, but they really have a good reputation around the city and this was a delight to read, so thanks for including it. The only thing, if I may, I'd like to include here, and we try to put this in the weekly report, um, the number of follow-up investigations that you see our detectives that uh, they close these cases months uh, after uh, a criminal offense has taken, has taken place. And I think one of the things that amplifies that um, is the information that we got of the letter from the Wheaton Police Department and from Elmhurst PD where uh, in one situation, our detectives assisted with a bank robbery and another with an officer involved shooting as part of the uh, Major Crimes Task Force officer involved shooting team. Um, this is just some valuable experience for our, our officers to get so um, that they are able to go out and, and use those investigative talents um, to solve those cases that do, do occur here. So thank you very much for those kind words. Thank you, Chief. All right, all I need is one more motion. Alderman Berry. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned. Thank you.